Hello, everybody. And thanks for your interest. Thanks for joining the session about the zero latency topic. So is that possible, actually? Good question. As a practical, when does it matter? That's a valid question. So I also want to share some use cases, but first introduce myself a bit. Uh, who am I? Who is Nanocosmos? I'm the founder of Nanocosmos going back to 1998. So we founded the company 25 years ago, just celebrated this year with the whole team. We were um, early innovators already starting with real-time encoding back in these days and created a live streaming platform for ultra low latency delivery a couple of years ago. Um, received several industry awards around that and have grown to a team of about 45 people now um, sitting around the globe and uh, supporting and um, developing our platform. So jumping into the use case again, um, uh, there were already some mentioned. I bring a, some, some different view, uh, viewpoints into this here. So the interactive component is very important for low latency applications. Engaging the audience, like we are now in this uh, Zoom session, which is more like a closed environment. You need to install an app and uh, have a smaller group, like whatever 100 people are now in this session. But when it goes to large scale deployments and uh, one to many deployments, you want to engage larger audiences, also get quick questions into your presentation and be able to answer them in real time. So that's one very important um, use case for low latency streaming. Um, which is also could be town hall meetings, webcast conferences, things like that. The other big thing, which is also mentioned already, is the monetized use cases where you monetize your content on each participant, which is then betting, live auctions, and things like that. And that requires really ultra low latency. And um, as there is no real um, standard definition in the industry, I agree also that it means sub-second latency end-to-end. -end to enable this interaction between the audience and the viewer. Yeah, things like live auctions were already mentioned. Having a live uh, video stream for the auction, um, filming the person, filming the things to be sold, and along with the live bits, which are then placed on the, uh, the web page, for example, to be in sync and to be in real time is uh, important to monetize the content. So you can't go far behind the a real-time signal on the show. You can imagine that as a yeah, eBay kind of application with live video, which is um, kind of existing for years now, but uh, the live video-based um, auction applications are not so widespread yet, but more and more growing. But that can also go to specific uh, niche applications like cattle auctions, um, livestock auctions, which we do with partners in the US, could be like real estate auctions where you sell your houses or flats, um, which also can be done with the video production on mobile. So it's mobile end-to-end -end in this case, but also needs to be in real time. And there can be different applications around that. One thing which was not mentioned yet was live shopping, which is also a growing industry. And you see interesting, interesting examples here, which um, for example is used here uh, where the presentation is done for products and also from the use case and from the user experience, it's uh, quite nicely made because you have overlays for the articles, you have um, bets coming in, popping up into the video feed. So that's also not a challenge only for the video itself, but also for creating a good user experience uh, for, the, for the participants to really be part of that monetized revenue channel and create some revenue for the, for the platform. There are more and more large vendors also taking part in that kind of application. IKEA is one of them. They doing they are doing also live shopping channels along with uh, their online catalog, which is an interesting use case as well because you have a timeline. They can also go back in the in the time to see what is uh, being offered in the live feed. So you have the real time um, stream on the one hand and the timeline based shopping channel on the other hand, and you can scroll and go back and forth and to directly um, do the shopping online. Other inter interesting examples, uh, sports training, uh, workout, wellness, or other education channels where you have a presenter, a trainer, a coach sharing some live content and you want to interact with the audience in real time. So that can, can also be entertainment driven, but also 
uh, with additional monetized revenue to create value for the presenters and for the platform. Sports betting, also growing industry, um, dependent on the legislation of the area where it's hosted in. And that can be horse racing or any other betting on sports, um, which is, um, yeah, also similar like an auction, getting bids into the into the stream. And then um, you can do that in real time to do this kind of micro betting approach. That means uh, betting during the, the game and not only betting on the on the end result, but also placing bets on the while the game is going on or while the race is going on. There are interesting hybrid applications and uh, innovative innovations also in this industry. You see an AI-based uh, live video here, which is uh, based on a live video stream and uh, adding um, AI and AR elements on the game to add some statistics on the uh, play out and on, on the game to be able to encourage the uh, audience to place bets on whatever statistics the players are doing here. So that's interesting things which combines technologies like augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and live video streaming in real time with the betting platforms. The AI um, technology is also more and more used in large scale applications, like for example, Amazon is doing that in, in the NFL transmissions and broadcasts to add statistics in real time, how the ball is passed, how the players are running. And these um, kind of additional value um, streams can also be combined with betting and um, yeah, also monetizing separate to the uh, video itself. As I mentioned, AI, we are also doing that um, uh, for our platform based on speech and the speech engine we put into our cloud, uh, which does uh, speech detection, speech recognition uh, that's used in town hall ap applications and uh, enterprise environments. So you have full control over the uh, video content and the audio content and still have the way to automatically add um, live captions and have that generated by an AI engine and still have the way to interact with the presenter by asking questions and giving feedback. So let's go into a bit more detail on the end-to-end uh, -end workflow, how that looks like. So we see this workflow always as a comprehensive approach coming from the live camera, going to the viewer, to the audience. So it starts from the camera, it goes to a live encoder, software, hardware, or appliance. Then it, there is an upstream sent to, to the live streaming platform. It's taken to the CDN to do the delivery worldwide to any region you want to reach. And then it goes to the player devices in the audience and every component of that workflow is very important and uh, takes part of the uh, latency. So if you want to reach zero latency or let's say as close to zero as possible, you need to take care that every part of that workflow is running seamlessly and uh, is running error-free. So creating a bad network situation on the upstream creates a bad network experience or a bad user experience for all viewers, of course. So it's important to get that under control. And to manage that, um, you need to collect some metrics and get some insights into the uh, workflow. So that's what we do on our platform, Nanostream Cloud. We collect metrics from all parts of the workflow coming from the encoder, um, the ingest, the CDN, the network, how it's traveling across the, the world and from the player, combine these metrics and create some uh, analytics around that. to get insight into the quality of service of your live stream and understand where you have a successful player experience, where you might have challenges, um, also what kind of quality rates are played out in the in the live stream, things like um, hostile network situations anywhere in the world, not only in remote locations, but also even in, uh, in Europe uh, happen always when you're on the commute, for example, but wanna be active and part of the user experience anytime. In real time, you need to have the right uh, network situation and the right adaption to the to the workflow that you create a successful layout in any cases. So it's a bit different to the lean back scenarios, which you usually usually have when watching a live stream and just enjoying a show. It's when you want to interact. It always comes to the latency question, and keeping that low end to end is very important for these cases. So the protocol question was also mentioned. Um, 
there are still a lot of used uh, setups based on RTMP ingest. That's still a valid workflow um, when the connection is good enough and there's no dropouts in the connection and you can rely on a, on a good TCP connection. You can go to ultra low latency with RTMP. You can also use uh, more advanced uh, upstream technologies like SRT, which are meant to be used for low latency as well. They're both not zero latency, so you still have a small buffer for these applications, but it can be a sub-second end-to-end also based on that. Um, and there are newer um, protocols like WebRTC and WIP, which we also support in our platform to go even lower and come closer to the real-time experience. And then um, you can also have different um, protocols on the playout side, which uh, can go from standard HLS, low latency HLS, ultra low latency HLS, WebSocket, WebRTC, but also newer protocols like uh, Quick, HTTP3, Web Transport, which are emerging and which are coming uh, on, onto new devices. And these technology decisions are difficult to take. So it's um, for you as a user or a creator of, uh, of a platform or an application, um, it's difficult to get these things under control. That's at, at least what we learned from our customers. So that's what we handle then um, to create that comprehensive approach and create a unified experience um, which covers the technology under the hood and um, um, lets you rely on the technology to make that seamlessly available to your audiences. As I mentioned, SRT, we are also SRT blocked, so that's a validation done in the broadcast industry to um, validate the, the product in certain environments, broadcast environments, like uh, dozens of vendors are doing these tests um, to each other and then validate that it's running well for SRT. Uh, as mentioned, WIP also is a valid ingest format based on WebRTC which can be used um, not only from the browser where WebRTC was designed to be used uh, in the first place, but also for uh, applications and uh, hardware setups or even OBS, the free software encoder can also now use uh, be used with the WIP protocol. But on the delivery side, it's important to have this ad adaption and that was already mentioned as well. So getting the uh, network situation under control or adjust to bad network situations and turn down the quality automatically is important to avoid buffering. So that's a very um, yeah, important part of the workflow for real-time encoding as well to have a successful live stream running on all devices, even if the network goes uh, very low. Analytics I mentioned to get insight into the uh, service uh, quality of your platform, quality of service, quality of experience. So that's um, part of the comprehensive approach to collect metrics on all ends and make that visible um, on the one end for get, creating more business, business intelligence, but also as a technical tool to help supporting uh, potential issues in the workflow. Um, monitoring as well. Um, that uh, is uh, challenging if you have uh, different parts of the workflow from different vendors to have the right tools and combine that um, to each other. And we have integrated that into one platform. Security was mentioned already and was asked. Things like DRM and protecting your content is uh, more and more important as well, uh, especially also in these uh, vertical industry segments. Um, there can be any any kind of misuse and uh, attacks on your content to try to hijack you or attack um, the, and, and misuse the content from your platform. So that's uh, why it's important that the platform also supports um, protecting against um, these kind of attacks. Yeah, that's the uh, kind of conclusion. It's not only about the delivery technology um, alone. It's not only about latency alone. It's a combination of several things. It uh, needs to be looked at end to end from the camera to the viewer, and it combines different um, tools into each uh, into the platform to have this comprehensive approach um, solved and provided to create a great user experience. Thanks for your interest, and I'm happy to hear your questions now. Yeah, thanks so much, Albert. That was uh, that was great, um, and uh, obviously a lot to think about there. Um, we're we're kind of close on time, so I just I I got a couple of really good questions here. Um, 
you know, you know, one of one of the issues always with uh, with with low latency and ultra low latency is is accepting the consequences of prioritizing it, right? So we have a question: um, Do you have any data that relates degree of performance improvement to cost? Yeah, that's a good question, but um, that's dependent also on the use case. So if you compare standard HLS to low latency, there's no big cost advantage to switch. So it doesn't really make sense because there might be impacts in the user experience if you just want to have a lean back scenario for getting a large audience um, provided with, with your content. But if you need interactivity, like in these uh, monetized channels or Q&A things, things like that, then you need to have ultra low latency. There's no other way around that. And uh, you cannot just trade off uh, low latency versus long latency because it's mandatory to solve the use case. So it depends, um, but um, the of course everybody is asking for co for cost and providing a cost efficient solution is uh, very important. And only having only premium um, customers uh, is not really scalable. So um, cost efficiency is important, and I think it can be efficient to 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 be used and to be added to these kind of business applications. Okay, great. Yeah, and then one other question from uh, Joanne. Um, you know, obviously, NanoCosmos operates on a on a global scale. Um, you know, what what differences, if any, are you seeing in low latency needs or demands uh, specific to countries or even regions? Yeah, yeah of course, it's challenging. So um, the uh, the world is big, and we are we are seeing more and more growth also in uh, regions like South America, Southeast Asia, Africa which are a bit difficult to handle um, initially because the large providers are not um, there with the full quality of service they usually provide. So we are working with several partners in these areas to provide the right quality. And the expectation really is from, from the, the industry we are working on and the customers we are working with, the latency needs to be the same all around the globe. So there, need, there can't be any trade-off and um, it needs to need several reliable um, content pro provided to to every participant in the workflow. And in case of uh, having network issues or something like that, you need to control that um, also on your platform somehow to take quality down or something, or uh, have at least something visible uh, in the content and not uh, lose the participants. Okay, well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, well, thanks so much, Albert. Thanks, uh, Nanocosmos. Cosmos. <laughs>